So hello, it's a great pleasure today uh, to talk about congenital CMV, although there's a little bit of sadness associated with that in that we still see in my country, Australia, uh, about one baby born every day with severe malformation due to congenital CMV. And in countries like the US with much larger populations, uh, we may see 10 or 15 babies born every day with problems due to congenital CMV. However, the really positive thing is that a lot of steps have been taken by groups, uh, both nationally and internationally, to stop CMV. And this, uh, uh, in the bottom left of your screen, was a campaign a few years ago that came out of the US, uh, where we all wrote stop CMV and um, put our hands up. Uh, the bottom right is our, the research team that I work with uh, here in Sydney, in Australia. And um, the other photo is of a meeting we had a couple of years ago when we came up with consensus recommendations. Uh, I think it's really important that we look at not only where we are now uh, and what we can do now, but also what we can do in the future. So just to put in perspective who I am, uh, I'm the director of what's called the Serology and Virology Division, which is a diagnostic division uh, we call SAVID. Uh, that's here in Sydney, and we do a lot of um, work on congenital infections. We have a, uh, a uh, clinic. Um, we have a, um, a role nationally and, and statewide in reference uh, testing. Uh, we do some whole genome sequencing, not only as part of testing, but also as research. And more recently, uh, I guess, along with a lot of maternal fetal medicine people, uh, a lot of midwives, um, uh, a range of policy makers, a range of non-government organisations, including the Cerebral Palsy Association, CPA, as well as the Congenital CMV Association of Australia, we've done a lot of work around uh, engagement and education. So I guess that's what I mean by there are a lot of things we can do now. Uh, on the left of your screen is some of uh, my research interests. Our, our group here works particularly on how virus gets uh, from the mother to the baby, and we're quite interested in how we might be able to uh, reduce that. Um, and we're, I'll show you a little bit of research, although really today is more about diagnosis and, and clinical and um, other aspects of uh, CMV. So here's the outline of uh, my talk. Um, the reality is that we have a lot of um, uh, clinical issues to do. Uh, we have a lot of clinical issues to deal with daily and we have a lot of work to do in diagnosis, uh, in prevention, and using uh, what we know in going forward. So I thought I'd start uh, just with the clinical issues, uh, talk a little bit about the epidemiology. Uh, by nature, this is going to be really about um, Australia, although uh, in many ways, developed countries have a very similar epidemiology of congenital CMV developing countries have quite a different uh, epidemiology because in developing countries the seropositivity rate is much higher and so the predominant nature of infection is reactivation. So um, uh, here's a photo of Thomas Weller who um, received the Nobel Prize. He, um, he described um, culture of CMV um, and uh, the re this, this photo, I think, was taken about 1955, um, 70 years on, uh, and we still have congenital CMV as the most common infectious cause of congenital malformation in developed countries. Uh, I think that's really an important statement to make up front and to think about uh, if we were having the same talk, say, 50 years ago, uh, maybe 60 years ago, uh, we'd be talking about rubella and, of course, rubella vaccination in developed countries, and again in Australia, to give the example, we, we don't have congenital rubella. Uh, there may be one case every uh, three to five years, uh, sadly, but that one case is typically in an unvaccinated person and uh, usually a person uh, from overseas. Rubella in adults still does occur, but the reality is that rubella vaccination has effectively eliminated congenital rubella syndrome. So 
that gives me a lot of hope that when we say congenital CMV is now most common uh, and it's the second most common overall, only second to cerebral palsy, that we can do something with things like vaccines and improved treatments and improved approaches that in going forward we can see the disappearance of congenital CMV uh, as a major cause of malformation and make this talk hopefully redundant in the same way that uh, a talk in Australia about, um, about rubella is largely of historical interest. Just to put it in perspective, um, CMV, the most common infectious cause of disabilities, much more common than Down syndrome, much more common than spina bifida, and uh, logarithmically more common than that, any other infection in this country. Uh, infections such as toxoplasmosis are rare, congenital um, disease due to herpes simplex or varicella zoster are vanishing, fortunately, vanishingly rare. So when you think about congenital CMV, of course, one of the rather confusing things is, firstly, we don't have a vaccine. And why don't we have a vaccine? We'll talk a little bit about that later. But in essence, uh, I think it's because um, we need more resources put into development of a CMV vaccine. And that may be coming along in the next five years. Uh, there are some candidates. But secondly, um, one of the other confusing things is that, in fact, when infection occurs in the mother and transmission occurs from mother to baby, most of those babies, about um, eight out of 10, uh, are normal and unaffected. Now, in obstetric terms, of course, uh, two out of 10 is actually a very high level of, of disease or disorder in an infant. But um, the reality is that there is something that means that some babies are being infected but also developing disease, whereas other babies become infected but don't develop disease. And so one of the aspects of research, of course, is to find out what's the difference between those two groups. Congenital CMV disease uh, typically causes sensory neural deafness. That's the most common outcome. That can be mild all the way to profound, and it can uh, get worse over, over an infant's life over the first uh, up to five years. Uh, vision loss and intellectual impairment, of course, are really very feared complications. And um, as part of the um, neurological disease, uh, cerebral palsy as well as things such as seizures can occur. Most severely, uh, the infant can die. Uh, and um, uh, I'll talk to you a little bit in a minute about stillbirth because we and others have become interested in whether stillbirth could be due to CMV. And the short answer is some cases are. Just looking again, uh, to put this in perspective, uh, one of the things that strikes me when I'm in clinic and, and talking to mothers and fathers about congenital CMV, whether they're at risk or whether they've had an affected baby or whether they um, have evidence of infection and they're wondering uh, what they will do with their pregnancy and how, whether they will continue or whether they would look at um, experimental treatments. One of the things that I'm typically told is, why didn't I hear about this? Why didn't I hear from my obstetrician? Why didn't I hear from my primary care physician? Why didn't my, I hear from my uh, midwives? Why didn't I hear at childcare? All those things. And, and one of the things that strikes people is this kind of graph. CMV is logarithmically more common than any other infection. They know about listeriosis, soft cheese. They know about toxo, cats and um, uh, raw meat. Uh, they know about avoiding these things, they know about vaccination, they've been vaccinated for rubella. And the reality is that parents um, can become very angry uh, that they haven't been told about CMV when I tell them uh, that the most common infection is CMV and congenital CMV. So what are the numbers? Uh, approximately 1% um, uh, overall of um, uh, women who, who become pregnant have a primary or first seeing the infection. Um, the, there was a systematic review that showed this is 0.64%. Um, about a third of those transmit um, across the placenta of the fetus. So CMV transmission to the infant is um, almost universally via the placenta, although uh, on occasion you can get postnatal CMV because CMV is excreted in the um, uh, uh, cervix. And of those um, that transmit, about one a third are symptomatic at birth and one third have later sequelae, so particularly sensorineurohearing loss. 
and that occurs up to the age of five years. This is from a paper uh, by Mike Cannon that uh, we participated in and published a few years ago, uh, looking at Australia, um, England and Wales and um, the US, and just showing the rough population at that time. Um, in Australia, just to give our figures, about 300,000 live births if you use 0.6%, which is, as I say, a fairly conservative figure for congenital CMV infection, that's about 1,800. And if you look at those who are symptomatic at birth and subsequently asymptomatic at birth but develop disease, you come up in Australia with a number around about three to 400 congenital CMV cases a year. That is about one a day of infants who have uh, moderate to severe disease. If you look at uh, England and Wales, that's about um, 800 a year and the US about uh, four to 5,000 a year. So proportionate to the population. The, the issue around screening is a vexed one. And um, again, when parents say, well, I didn't know about this, but why wasn't I screened? I'm screened for HIV. I have screening testing for hepatitis C. Uh, I have screening testing for syphilis. Uh, I have uh, screening testing sometimes for group B streptococcus. Um, all of these things are reasonable in a, uh, a population um, where we have the resources to do this, where uh, we can eliminate and do some things about these infections. Uh, why aren't I screened for CMV? Well, uh, it's a difficult and complex question that we'll talk about, but at the moment the recommendation is screening for CMV is not a good idea, although I think that will change over the coming years as we develop better treatments, as vaccination comes uh, on board, and as we uh, realise that uh, we can prevent uh, these infants from uh, developing severe disease due to congenital CMV. But this just puts it in context. Uh, we now screen uh, for hearing disorders routinely in Australia and in many developed countries. Uh, we screen for things like amino acid disorders and um, a number of haemoglobinopathies. There's nothing wrong with that, but the point is that these are many-fold lower than congenital CMV disabilities. So these other conditions are important. There's no doubt about that. We screen for them, and yet CMV, which is far more common, we don't screen for. So uh, what are the sort of risks? The other thing that happens in my clinic is that uh, the typical uh, mother who is at risk has often a first child, maybe uh, CMV zero negative, but then acquires um, infection and um, risk of infection, particularly when that child is um, in uh, childcare. And this is a paper we published a couple of years ago. There are similar papers from Europe and the, the US, as well as um, Asian countries, Japan. Um, and this basically looks at the, the odds ratio from a number of studies where uh, the risk of um, uh, CMV acquisition in daycare centres or DCCs was examined compared to controls. And basically, if you're in a daycare centre, that child has a higher risk of acquiring CMV. Usually in these infants, they're asymptomatic and usually there's no problem. However, the risk, of course, is they, they transmit to their uh, mother who is pregnant and seronegative at that time. So I've talked a bit about the clinical effects of congenital CMV, particularly about sensory neural hearing loss. Uh, this is a list of the other things. Um, clearly, the most feared um, are the severe intellectual uh, impairment and uh, microcephaly, as well as um, death of the infant from overwhelming infections. But things like hepatosplenomegaly, uh, jaundice, um, premature birth are very important causes of ongoing disease. I mentioned sensory neuro hearing loss, and this is from a paper, uh, again, a few years ago, looking at um, all causes of hearing loss. So the etiology in a, uh, an infant population who are being screened for hearing loss, and CMV was, congenital CMV was present in about 8%. We have a national uh, paediatric surveillance study, the Australian Paediatric Surveillance Unit, or APSU study, which has been looking at congenital CMV uh, amongst uh, a diagnosis amongst paediatricians for over 20 years. And if you look at um, the highlighted on the uh, left of your screen, central neuro hearing loss is found uh, in about 10 to 20%, depending upon um, 
uh, when the infection was diagnosed. Congenital CMV is properly diagnosed before three weeks of age, although probable cases are diagnosed after that. So clearly sensory neurohearing loss is important. There have been a number of studies, um, including one from us in Australia uh, that we published a couple of years ago where we found rates of around 6% of um, congenital CMV in hearing loss, which had been identified with universal newborn, newborn hearing screening. And that's similar to papers from uh, the US, uh, papers from uh, the Netherlands, papers from the UK, where levels of around 5 to 10% um, have been found. So once new universal newborn hearing screening became available, it became logical to test any of those children who were failing hearing screening, that is, who had sensory neurohearing loss, to test them for congenital CMV. This led to questions about whether, uh, with universal newborn hearing screening, should all those um, uh, infants who are tested have um, congenital CMV testing, which is simply a salivary swab or a urine swab uh, tested using um, typically a, a polymerase chain reaction, a PCR or, or other molecular test specific for CMV. And if it was positive, and particularly positive within the first three weeks of life, then appropriate interventions for congenital CMV could be undertaken. That, um, that was a theoretical paper that um, uh, we published with Mike Cannon about five years, six years ago. And then we also looked at whether some of the treatments um, were a benefit. And in fact, there are some treatments that now have a marginal benefit. And what we hope is in going forward, we could find benefits that um, were much larger and would make treatment more effective. Three years ago, we published um, uh, this paper down the bottom left of your screen where we looked at consensus recommendations because a number of us um, internationally felt that there, there were enough data to start telling us what we should be doing and providing better evidence-based recommendations for things like diagnosis uh, and, and to inform, I guess, governments in a scientific and evidence-based way about whether they should be doing universal screening uh, for CMV in mothers, whether they should be doing universal screening for congenital CMV in infants, and, and really to assist with that decision making. And so these um, recommendations, which were written, uh, uh, published three years ago, but written, of course, about four years ago, we hope to update. And um, uh, there's a meeting next year when um, people gather internationally to look at this. Uh, there are also recommendations published around the same time from Europe, although they particularly address treatment. And so what a number of us to have done, and, and this is an example from here in Australia, um, is look at uh, what we can do now and how we can better inform parents. And this is one example. Um, one of the things that, that struck us early on was that CMV is common, um, that uh, stillbirth is the uh, most frequent cause of death up until the age of 14 years in this country and in many developed countries, and that about half of those um, cases of stillbirth had no cause. And given that congenital CMV is known to cause death in utero, we therefore looked for links. And in fact, we found a um, close association using uh, PCR. As you all know, PCR can um, uh, be associated with contamination, so we did these very carefully. But we also looked at a different non PCR-based uh, method, which was immunohistochemistry, or IHC. And in these unexplained cases of stillbirth, we found a significant rate of uh, infection, that is, congenital CMV infection. And so uh, we went on to look at um, other causes because we thought uh, we should try and take a more um, nuanced approach and see maybe infection is more common than we expect. But in fact, infection is really quite rare in stillbirth, except with human cytomegalovirus. That is, congenital CMV is, is causing a number of unexplained stillbirth cases. We repeated this prospectively and got a lo lower number, but still a significant number of um, unexplained stillbirth is due to congenital CMV. One of the things we did was in collaboration with um, uh, pathologists to look at whether there was something biologically plausible because it's very important, as you know, that if you do find an association, it's not just spurious, it's not just um, 
something that occurs, but it's not actually causative. And in fact, um, these cases, uh, the infants who had stillbirth, who had died, uh, who were congenital CMV positive, had a very high rate of what's called fetal thrombotic vasculopathy, which is really put more simply a, uh, a form of um, disease in the placenta where the blood vessels clot. And um, as you might expect, that results in a placenta that can become um, uh, inefficient at exchanging between the mother and the uh, fetus and um, is a plausible manner in which CMV might be causing uh, stillbirth. And so uh, we and others continue to look at this. These are um, just to, to show you some real data. And again, this is now published, so uh, you can look it up. But in essence, if you look at the placenta of um, a baby who has sadly died from uh, um, congenital CMV, that is, who is stillborn and died in utero, um, then you see a lot of inflammatory changes. Uh, you see a lot of inflammation. You see a lot of um, Th1 bias in the cytokines. You see things like TNF-alpha, uh, MCV1, which are inflammatory cytokines. And you see this associated with um, infection, uh, with CMV. And so not only do we have a plausible uh, cause for some of these unexplained stillbirths, we also have a plausible mechanism, which is that the virus stimulates um, inflammation that's via cytokines and i won't go in detail but there are very good reasons why a cytokine based inflammatory response would be logical and uh, that we're actually seeing um, pathology as a result of this which is um, likely to cause the um, baby to have died so what that gives us is some options and it gives us some options for um, uh, how we might intervene intervene further down the track um, before this occurs uh, in order to prevent stillbirth. So now on to a more, I guess, pragmatic issue, which is diagnosis. And as I mentioned before, a little bit of discussion about um, screening and, and the logistics of that potentially. One of the problems with CMV is um, that around about half of um, women who have primary CMV during pregnancy have no symptoms at all. So really, maternal illness is not a good way of thinking about why you might be testing a, a newborn. Um, I've shown you some daycare centre data. So if a mother is exposed either through working in daycare or having children in daycare, and that mother is known to be seronegative for CMV, then she can undertake things that reduce her risk. But certainly things like prematurity, the presence of uh, a sexually transmitted uh, infection or high-risk behaviours, um, younger mothers who have no antenatal care, those kind of things are the, the, the flags, if you like, that make us think about testing a newborn for congenital infections because those things are associated with high risk of congenital infection. The um, uh, other important point is, of course, if a neonate presents with something, and we've talked about hearing loss, um, and the fact that targeted, te what I, I call and others call targeted testing rather than screening. Um, but there are other things that make you think that a neonate may have um, uh, had an infection in utero. If they're premature and prematurity occurs in about um, one in 10, one in 12 um, infants, uh, if they have a, um, evidence of, of neurological disease, things like hydrocephalus or microcephaly um, with other uh, without other explanations. Um, if they're small, if they're small for gestational age or SGA, and if they have other things that might be associated with infection like jaundice or hepatitis splen splenomegaly, then it's really important to think about testing um, those infants. And um, uh, often um, in, in our setting, we, uh, we see these infants in collaboration with the paediatricians um, because it's very important to look at the pregnancy and, and how that's progressed. Uh, again, often asked, you know, what specimens should be taken? And um, my response is usually as many as, you, as you're willing to take. Um, but most importantly, urine and a throat swab because the sorts of infections we're looking for, particularly uh, CMV, uh, but also things like enteroviruses and other infections, a throat swab uh, and a urine is very useful. It's also important to think about um, the context. And for example, if um, neonatal serum is difficult to obtain, 
And of course, antibody in, in neonatal serum is often derived from the mother by uh, transplacental transmission. It's also important potentially to take the mother's serology to see whether she has had an infection. And obviously in specific cases where um, an infant may, may have neurological disease, then uh, lumbar puncture and collection of cerebrospinal fluid, uh, if there are skin lesions or uh, if there's any other symptomatology, then appropriate specimens are taken. It's also important to look at the placenta and do histopathology and potentially to do testing using molecular tests for infection of the placenta. The sorts of tests we do today, of course, are mainly based around nucleic acid testing, so predominantly PCR, uh, although um, there are other types of nucleic acid tests used. Uh, and things like immunofluorescence and virus culture are really for the um, reference or research laboratory. We still do a lot of serology, and typically that's done with enzyme immunoassay EIA in high throughput, uh, well-established, really nicely done uh, commercial systems. Um, there are issues around the utility of IgM in a, a clinical setting, and I'll talk about that briefly. As a reference laboratory, we here at SAVID still do things like complexation and inofluorescence, although they're really in the small number of difficult cases where we can't sort them out using uh, enzyme immunoassay, commercial assays. And electron microscopy, again, as you know, not done routinely, but a research or reference tool. Of course, increasingly, um, other sorts of testing are available. We test the neonatal blood screening card or dried blood spots for things like CMV DNA, um, and they can also be used to test from remote and rural settings. Um, we increasingly do multiplex testing because, of course, although congenital CMV is the most common, when uh, uh, the question arises, for example, in re regards to high drops fatalis, where there's a, a baby with a lot of uh, fluid and the question of parvovirus B19 is raised, then the use of multiplex is where we test for usually five or six at the moment, um, different viruses and, and different agents, including things like parvo B19, CMV, uh, Toxoplasma gondii, um, perhaps um, uh, treponema for syphilis. That kind of testing will provide a very quick way of, of ruling out things that are extremely unlikely, but you don't want to miss because they're treatable. Increasingly, we now genotype our um, CMV isolates using whole genome sequencing. That's become um, somewhere sort of halfway between the um, research and diagnostic laboratory. Uh, and in some centres, it's freely available. It is in ours now. Still some technical difficulties. You do need higher amounts of virus in order to be able to, to obtain a successful whole genome sequence, although as we work further and become more familiar with the technology, it will clearly become easier to test even at lower viral loads, and we hope for that in the next year or so. Once a neonate is born, as I mentioned, the neonatal blood screening card can be used um, if they're not seen soon enough after birth, although if they are seen within the first three weeks of life, um, urine, and we collect urine and saliva, uh, although the correlation between them is very close. They're fairly easy to collect. Um, our urine is collected by us in nappies. We're using cotton wool balls. Uh, we recently published this, and it's pretty straightforward. The problem being, of course, trying to put a urine bag onto an unhappy, um, uh, struggling, um, crying uh, neonate is something that disturbs the whole room <laughs> and becomes very difficult, uh, very uncomfortable, not not pleasant for the uh, baby um, and really unpleasant for the parents. And so anything that can make that easier in testing neonates is really a, a, a great advance. And so we now collect urine and saliva routinely, as I mentioned, on any child fi failing their uh, hearing screening. We routinely request um, testing of their um, neonatal blood screening card, and that's relatively straightforward these days. So back to screening. Um, at the moment, our guidelines uh, internationally do not recommend screening of all pregnant uh, mothers for CMV using a CMV IgG. I think that is a reasonable summation of a difficult area. Um, however, if you look at the sorts of criteria that were published now uh, over 
uh, 20 years ago. Um, if, you, if you wanted to look at introducing a new screening test, you had to have detailed knowledge of the effect on the, of the condition. Um, we have some knowledge of that in congenital CMV, so it gets a tick. But it is very much dependent upon timing the infection. It, it's very difficult during pregnancy um, to really time infection because you can't sample um, the fetus easily except by amniocentesis or cordocentesis. That's invasive. It carries a risk for the pregnancy. It carries a risk for the mother. Uh, it carries a risk for the fetus. So um, the, the amount of knowledge we will ever gain is going to be, uh, it's going to be difficult. Um, do we have highly accurate and specific tests? We certainly do in seeing the IgG serology. So we can certainly tell mothers whether they're um, uh, immune, that is, they have seen the IgG or not, and therefore whether they're um, at risk of primary infection. The difficulties are around IgM and um, the fact that a number of mothers are IgM positive and yet have had uh, remote infections many years before, but they probably do have truly persisting um, IgM. We don't think this is cross reactivity. And this can be sorted out using uh, CMV IgG avidity. So it is possible to sort it out and it is possible to um, not, uh, not have something that's confusing, but it does require resources and it does require people to be available in order to test for, um, test for this. Um, is it a significant health problem? Well, I hope I've convinced you that it is, that there's no doubt that this is the infectious and the problem with um, congenital infections and going forward. Um, are any actions on the basis of results ethically acceptable? This is increasingly becoming sorted out. It's difficult. It's um, not something that we can... Um, uh, it, it's, it's something that changes with time. It's not definitive, and um, but uh, the uncertainty of diagnosis, particularly with uh, things like IgM, a lot of that's been reduced with newer tests, and a lot of that's been improved with things like uh, avidity. And um, one thing that we didn't have until the last few years were the economic implications. Is this cost saving? Does this improve the overall? Um, uh, you know, economic good of the um, um, uh, population. Can you justify this? And I, I think I'd like to, to think that we can justify the um, uh, this on the basis of improving health without any doubt. Um, can we justify it economically? Well, Soren Gant published a paper in 2016 uh, from uh, North America, uh, his, in Canada, and that clearly showed um, economic benefit. Williams published a paper around the same time, um, uh, again in the UK, uh, and again showed economic benefit. So really, we're coming to the point where we need to discuss this again um, in a group of international experts and talk further about screening. If you look at current screening, it's it's quite um, it's quite interesting because, of course, things like syphilis and Group B streptococcus we can do something about. We can use antibiotics. Um, things like uh, rubella we still screen, and yet, as I mentioned, because of vaccination, uh, it's a uh, it's a re it's a vanishingly rare disease. And these are numbers from Australia. Um, there were 51 cases of rubella. Uh, between the 10 years between 2001 and 2011. Uh, and there were three cases over, over that time of congenital rubella syndrome. So it's important to sort out there, there need to be cases of rubella before you can get cases of congenital rubella syndrome. And really one every three years is a tiny number. And that's great. It's a fantastic benefit of uh, vaccination. Uh, the question then arises whether we still need to do screening. And, and reasonably we still do, although um, of course, with cost-benefit uh, discussions, it's important to look at what we do, not only in going forward, but what we've done in the past. If we did screen antenatally, we would find at risk and low-risk women. It would be definitive for whether they were seronegative or seropositive. As I mentioned, much harder if we did IgM because of the issues around persisting IgM. Uh, we do know that um, interventions such as hand washing and gloves reduce the transmission rate. Um, we don't have a great uh, vaccine. There was one, uh, the trial for which uh, was published by Bob Pass, uh, now 
um, some time ago, 10 years, and it only showed about a 50% um, efficacy. Um, uh, and we do know that targeted screening for hearing loss works uh, well, somewhere between 5 to 10% of, uh, of affected um, neonates being found. As I mentioned, we published this, but there's been lots of other publications from people globally. Um, and I guess one thing is you've got to look at the downsides. Antenatal screening will miss women who are seropositive but who reactivate, and that's an important number of women who, tra who are transmitting. Um, s many women during pregnancy reactivate CMV. A small proportion of them transmit to the baby, and those babies can be as severely affected as with primary infection. Uh, but also, of course, some infants who have congenital CMV uh, don't have hearing loss at birth, but by the age of um, five years, they will have um, uh, had hearing loss. And so that's around about um, half, two thirds of those who eventually have hearing loss during the congenital, due to congenital CMV. So it's really important that if we do look at screening uh, of mothers, for example, that we think about what the downsides can be. So uh, the reality is um, uh, if you have adequate follow-up screening works, there's a reason to do something. And um, uh, it's, it's obvious that's, that whether we screen or not, testing an individual mother is important and you need to think about the individual um, uh, person. Um, and there is um, now health economic evidence for population screening. And what we now need is that to be done in a population and, and for it to be measured properly because the papers that I mentioned from um, Gantt and the one from Williams are really theoretical based around modelling. And they clearly show an economic benefit, but ideally what we need to do is now do that in the population. Uh, again, from the paper by Mike Cannon, um, these are US figures. And this looked at um, if we screened all neonates, and this is in the US where there's um, uh, about 4 million, 4.5 million live births. And if we just went through a sort of decision tree and said, well, if we screened all neonates, how much hearing loss would we prevent? And down the bottom of this slide is where I'd like you to focus. There's good evidence uh, and fair evidence that would probably um, improve the lives of around about um, about a thousand um, babies every year in the US. Uh, and that would be because we'd be picking up asymptomatic infections, we'd be picking up um, uh, a number of children who would not necessarily be diagnosed otherwise. If you do the same thing with cognitive deficits, so with neurological deficits due to congenital CMV, you don't get um, as strong evidence, but uh, you do get fair evidence for a population of about um, uh, one to one and a half thousand. So this was really aimed at sort of modelling if we screened, would what, what do we think the benefit would be? And there's no doubt that there would be some. So. It's really very much watch this space, I think, over the next one to five years. And as we make decisions about, you know, screening and as we think about policy and we think about um, testing and as our testing and other algorithms become more um, developed, uh, my view is that there will be a number of countries going forward looking at um, universal neonatal screening and considering um, universal maternal screening for CMV. Of course, even though we try for many years, there are just some things we can't get people to do. So what about mother-to-child transmission? I mentioned this before, and I'd just like to show you a little bit of research because I think it's important in, in considering our interventions, which will be uh, my final set of discussion. Um, because if you don't understand what's happening, then how are you going to intervene properly? I mentioned that CMV is um, transmitted vertically mainly through the uh, via the placenta, so transplacental transmission. Um, postnatal transmission can occur via breast milk, and certainly um, CMV is transmittable by breast milk, along, in fact, with antibodies that are present. Um, but most, uh, most, the vast majority of congenital CMV is due to transplacental transmission, uh, and. What that means is that somehow from the maternal uh, circulation on the left of the slide, 
virus is able to get across the uh, tro syncytio trophoblast and trophoblast layer and get into the blood the blood vessels that then um, uh, supply blood to the fetus. And they're the ones shown here in the middle of the villus, that, that um, prominent thing sticking out from the right to the left. And what CMV does is it disrupts these layers. Clearly the placenta works very well to stop infection from getting across to the uh, mother. Um, the reality is that by causing disruption to the syncytiotrophoblasts, CMV can get across more easily. There are specific markers. But unfortunately, as part of that, CMV not only infects the fetus, but infects the placenta and causes damage to the placenta. And number two here shows reduced cytotrophoblast invasion, which is a major, major problem of, of disease, of causing disease rather, because um, shallow placentation really results in reduced gas and nutrient supply to the placenta and hence to the fetus. And what that means is that the um, fetus effectively becomes starved. Now, unfortunately, that's the cause of a lot of the problems that um, arise in that, that infant subsequently. Cytotrophoblasts and placenta are a very interesting organ. I'm not going to talk about that in any detail, except that cytotrophoblasts, those cells I showed you on the surface, do have cell receptors for CMV. Um, they do change as the... Um, uh, as the, they mature, so as the placenta matures, they go from different cell sort of types and different protein markers. And as they do that, unfortunately, they become uh, susceptible to CMV infection. The, um, the placenta, as I mentioned, is a fascinating organ, uh, one of our research interests. And this basically shows uh, what we and others do, where we take the placenta um, uh, from a consenting mother um, we, we in, um, uh, in cell culture, grow it over a period of time and then we're able to infect it and um, uh, we can use that placenta in order to understand better how CMV uh, affects the placenta and affects the fetus. This is just the model we use very quickly. We infect a, a lower layer. Those little stars are um, a virus coming up to infect the placenta layer, which is floating on a, um, a nutrient bed. We then um, uh, look at what happens with infection of that placenta. In this case, we look at cytokine expression. What that means is that we can um, understand what CMV infection is doing to the real placenta, not just to, to isolated or animal placenta, but to the human placenta. And I won't go through in detail, but um, if you just look this is one of our experiments from a while ago. The red here is CMV identified, and this is a placenta which has been infected with CMV, and then we've measured uh, what it's done to the cytokines. And, of course, this is a, a fantastic model uh, where we can examine the, what the effects of um, antivirals are on CMV infection. So a little bit about prevention, a little bit about treatments, and a little bit of research. This is a sad phrase that um, uh, one of... Uh, a woman who and her partner who consulted me um, and and really this is why we are so keen on prevention because um, the evidence is less than one in ten in many populations less than five um, parents have ever heard of CMV or congenital CMV don't do anything about it and the first time they hear about it is when they have an affected baby or evidence on ultrasound of an affected fetus and really, at that point, the opportunities for prevention have completely gone. So again, back to our international recommendations um, published three years ago, all pregnant women should be provided information on congenital CMV infection. This is just a no-brainer. This is just the way it should be. And it's important that this is provided in a, a cautious, in a well-informed uh, manner, that they're allowed follow-up. Um, that they are allowed, um, you know, the opportunity to digest it. But really the sorts of things we're talking about shown in the, the cartoon at the top that mothers can do to prevent transmission, things like washing your hands, not sharing food, uh, kiss on the forehead, not on the lips, um, wear gloves when you're changing nappies. Those things reduce transmission from mother to baby by about 40%. So almost one in two cases of congenital CMV infection could simply be prevented by mothers knowing about it, um, mothers doing something about it and just reducing their risk of transmission.
doesn't cost anything, not terribly inconvenient. We uh, did some work a while ago and looked at the messages around congenital CMV prevention and mothers, fathers find this very acceptable. They don't find it threatening so long as they're provided with um, uh, appropriate information, so long as they're provided with the opportunity to discuss it, then 99% of women want more information. And that's a pretty good um, a number. Um, we do know that education results in um, improvements in their behaviour. Amanda Lazaro published that in 2019. And we do know that this has a direct result on how many women seroconvert and become infected. And Maria Grazzi Ravello in Italy published that five years ago. Uh, so really, the message is clear. Uh, tell parents about congenital CMV. They don't get frightened. They um, uh, don't have to have a high education level to understand hand washing, lack of sharing of foods, kiss on the forehead, not on the lips. It's not complicated. And this reduces congenital CMV and it reduces transmission by up to half. As I mentioned, um, not many parents know about uh, CMV, but interestingly, only one in 10 health professionals in Australia, and we believe it's similar internationally in other developed, in other developed countries, only one in 10 healthcare professionals, when we did this survey, were talking with their pregnant women about CMV. All the times we talk about rubella, all the times we talk about toxo, all the times we talk about listeria are important. This is one more thing, but it's the most important of all of those. So th what do we do about it? As I mentioned, um, we and others are doing lots, uh, approaching midwives, uh, working on structured educational programs, uh, primary care physicians, uh, doing webinars, um, the College of General Practitioners here in Australia, we've been associated with webinars, and also uh, linking up with in-hospital services to provide information. And things like social media campaigns, as you know, have enormous reach. Um, uh, things like advertisements on Google, um, things like providing um, internet access, you know, accessible Facebook, Twitter feeds, uh, going on television and saying uh, congenital CMV is important. And people are doing this everywhere in, around the world. And these are just examples of what's been done in Australia because that's where I practice. But these get enormous reach and maybe are making a difference. There's a, there's a sort of qualitative view in, that I'm getting in my clinics and stuff that people are a bit better educated than they were. Um, internationally, congenital CMV has been added to the new WHO birth defect surveillance toolkit, which is fantastic because we've largely talked about developed countries because that's where I practice and that's where my work is. However, developing countries have a significantly higher rate of congenital CMV because of reactivation and transmission. And so international efforts like this are critical to to getting large numbers of people globally aware of congenital CMV. Um, this is a book where, um, uh, which is a sort of, you know, um, common language, uh, how to, what it's like to be pregnant and what you need to look out for and CMV's been included in this year's edition. Um, there's e-learning modules. The benefit of those, of course, is they're free, they're created and then they're globally available. And things like CMV awareness, um, get a bit overshadowed, as you might expect, by the current um, pandemic and issues, but they still go on and um, uh, they still continue and uh, people who are engaged with these have been universally um, praising them as a way of getting their education up but also getting their parents up, uh, the parents that they see and getting their understanding of education better. So a little about, bit about therapies. In essence, there's no great therapy at the moment during pregnancy, and that's why we need more research. Um, again, uh, this is a review um, which showed limited evidence for intravenous immunoglobulin. Um, it looked at um, uh, vaccine, the initial vaccine trial, which again, as I mentioned, showed 50% efficacy. It's not all gloom and doom. There are further studies looking at um, things like ballet cyclovir. These are probably um, 
treatments like immunoglobulin that during pregnancy reduce the risk of transmission by a very small amount. And, and in talking to patients, I use the term experimental treatments. However, what they do provide is a launch pad for our next group of, um, of antivirals. Uh, we and others are interested in small interfering RNAs, and this, this simply shows some published data. Uh, it, it essentially shows that sRNAs do inhibit CMV. They inhibit the amount of CMV. They inhibit um, mother-to-child transmission in our placental model. And a lot of people are doing very sophisticated work on this, clearly. There are also um, new antivirals um, based around things like Marivivir and Latermivir, which are now licensed for use in transplantation. Um, but those antivirals tend to be much less toxic, and so it will be important to look at those in um, pregnancy and certainly uh, having phase three trials where we can see them. Uh, it's also important to continue to develop novel and new antivirals. This, these are some that we work on, but again, there are many that um, people work on internationally. These quinazolines are um, uh, very effective in reducing CMV infection, but they are toxic, and so that's what um, we and others are looking at. And finally, I mentioned earlier on about the placenta being damaged. It's really important that we um, think about the fetus as being dependent upon the placenta and we think about the placenta and the fetus as a, a single unit, if you like. So there's no, there's no point in just stopping infection if the placenta is so damaged by cytokines, for example, that the baby is not going to be um, receiving nutrition and therefore the baby is dying because of that. So really important that we think about that. Um, uh, DIRCs are a uh, human protein that are um, uh, present in placenta and um, we've looked at these in placental models and if you actually inhibit uh, this particular protein, which is upregulated by CMV, so when CMV infects the placenta, the amount of DIRC goes up um, if you stop that from happening, then what we see, in fact, is that um, you also stop infection. So it's a um, it's a really good potential target. And look, there are many of these, or there are several of them, uh, uh, but there's enough that we have um, the opportunity to look at these inhibitors as potential treatments and in going forward that we can have great hope that um, with congenital CMV, not only will vaccines be important, but um, also treatments will be uh, hopefully available. This is more a five to 10 year timeline, but that's what research is about. It's looking to the future and, and taking your best shot now and doing your best work and um, finding something that um, potentially will work in the future. The other thing, of course, is, um, is exchange of information. Something that's changed so completely this year that it's hard to imagine that last year we used to go to international conferences, uh, but really, um, that continuing international global exchange is absolutely critical. So just a summary, um, CMV prevention is proven to reduce infections. So I think there's two things, and I, I like this from Dr. Seuss, thing one and thing two. Um, uh, the reality is the first thing is we can do something now. We can absolutely do things like um, inform mothers, inform fathers, get healthcare workers better informed, provide information online about CMV prevention, hand washing, don't kiss on the lips, don't share food, don't co sleep. Uh, a lot of don'ts, but um, uh, what it does is makes uh, the risk of CMV lower, and what it does is reduces the number of babies dying and severely affected from uh, CMV every year. And we know this, and we know this now. So we should be doing it, and we should be doing it to the utmost of our ability as clinicians. Uh, for the, the parents that we're seeing. And it doesn't cost anything. It, it's really minimal cost. The other thing, one, that we can do now is targeted testing. So testing of infants who fail sensory neural hearing screening loss and considering more broadly uh, screening tests for uh, uh, all neonates and for um, uh, all mothers and considering it in a, um, uh, a sensible evidence-based way because we've got enough, much more evidence. The second thing we need to do is really to continue to uh, understand and develop new treatments and develop new vaccines. And there's plenty of these coming along and there's some really great vaccine work, of course, being done currently with the pandemic. And some of that will actually transmit into CMV um, uh, 
vaccines. So research is critical. Um, it's important to understand the, the fetus as, a, uh, as an interacting person or for interacting uh, part that um, interacts with the uh, placenta and with the mother and that think about what's happening at a, at a, a global level. Think about uh, how we can intervene and um, improve those outcomes for the fetus, not only now but in going forward in the future. So finally, uh, we're about at the end. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the group that I work with, which is the top left. We also group, work with a group of um, Manfred Marshall, who's based in Erlangen in Germany. Uh, of course, in these days, we work um, at, at a distance and we work uh, with video and that works very well. We don't see as much of each other directly or as much of our students, but these are the people who've done the work. These are the people who, um, uh, are doing research, but also a number of people in public health who are introducing and changing policy as we go. And finally, uh, I really like to thank the parents. Uh, this is a group of people who, uh, with congenital CMV, suffer with their children and who, with things like the um, non government organisations, Congenital CMV Association Australia, uh, the Cerebral Palsy Alliance, there are similar um, NGOs all around the world and these are people who suffered because their children have congenital cmv and they stand with them and um, it's their support that really keeps us going so thank you very much for your attention and um, we'll draw to a close